Well, I'd like to welcome you all to this Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, your Child's Health University lecture uh, on It's Time to Talk About It, Eating Disorders and the Brain. I'm Nancy Sanchez. I manage community health education programs at Packard Children's. I'm so pleased to ha uh, that you've chosen to come and join us this evening for this lecture. And I wish to especially welcome our uh, esteemed doctors who are here giving their time this evening. You're going to meet Dr. Neville Golden, Dr. Kara Fitzpatrick, Dr. James Locke, and Dr. Cynthia Capon. They've come to enlighten us on this topic this evening. Our format will be this. We're going to have the four presentations done by each of uh, our presenters, uh, and then a panel discussion will follow uh, with uh, questions that you're going to provide during the session. Now, everyone hopefully has picked up a uh, folder like this with some handouts, some information about um, eating disorders and about our program here. Um, and there are some index cards. If you have a question that occurs to you during the presentation, uh, jot it down. And then after each presentation, as the next doctor is coming up to speak, we're going to collect them. And then during the panel, we will sort the questions and ask them according to theme. Uh, for privacy reasons, we can't take personal questions. Uh, it wouldn't be appropriate in this format anyway. So uh, please do keep your questions to things that you think might be relevant to the entire group, if you would. Um, you know that this is being videotaped this evening, and in a few weeks it will be available on both the Packard Children's website as well as Stanford iTunes. So let's begin. Uh, I'd like to first introduce to you Dr. Neville Golden. Dr. Golden is Chief of the Division of Adolescent Medicine at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and the Marin and Mary Elizabeth Kendrick Professor in Pediatrics at Stanford University School of Medicine. He's a board-certified pediatrician and an adolescent medicine specialist with more than 28 years of clinical experience. He's nationally and internationally renowned in his research on the medical complications of eating disorders. He has a focus on the management of amenorrhea and osteoporosis in anorexia nervosa. Tonight, Dr. Golden will begin uh, with this presentation, Brain, Biology, and Eating Disorders. Thanks, Dr. Golden. Thank you, Nancy. Um, good evening and welcome, everybody. In the next 15 minutes or so, what I hope to do is to make a case that the brain, biology, and eating disorders are intricately interrelated. <clears throat> we don't know what causes eating disorders. They've been around for many, many years. They were first described in the 1600s. But we do know that biology makes, plays a major role. We know that there are biological predisposing factors. We know that genetics plays a role. We know that there are some neuroendocrine abnormalities that, predispose to, that may predispose to an eating disorder. They certainly are there at low weight, and they remain after weight restoration. We know that 95% of young people with eating disorders develop them during adolescence. This is a time of major changes in linear growth, in body weight, body composition. Many of these are under the influence of sex hormones, but not only that, the brain also matures during that time. And that's, this is the time when the brain undergoes myelination, and that's not complete until the early 20s. And we know that dieting plays a major role, and there are biological changes that occur during dieting, even in those who are previously healthy. The best studies on malnutrition were not done in teenagers with eating disorders. They were conducted in young men average age of about 25, who volunteered to undergo semi-starvation in the 1945-1950 era. These men were conscientious objectors. They didn't want to fight in the Korean War. And they were voluntarily starved on about 1,600 calories a day. And they developed all the clinical features that we see in young people with anorexia nervosa or other eating disorders. They developed low pulse rates, vital sign instability, hypotension, lowered resting energy expenditure, um, low testosterone levels, low sperm counts, osteoporosis. But what's interesting, not only did they develop these medical complications, but also they began to obsess about their weight, dream about food, collect recipes, 
They be one became depressed and had suicidal ideation, and the other became bulimic. So I, I put it to you, and I often think about this, that anyone who undergoes semi-starvation, even without predisposing factors, can develop many of the features that we talk about. In talking about the genetics, we know that the concordance for identical twins is higher than for non-identical twins with eating disorders. We also know that women with a first-degree relative suffering from an eating disorder has a tenfold increased incidence of developing an eating disorder. It doesn't mean that that person will develop an eating disorder, but the risks are higher. We haven't found any single gene or group of genes, but we do know that for anorexia nervosa, there is susceptibility in the region of one of the chromosomes, chromosome 1. For bulimia, it's in the region of chromosome 10p. The point I'm making is that there are some biological determinants in terms of whether one develops an eating disorder or not. Probably some of the most interesting changes, though, are some of the structural brain changes that occur in young people with anorexia nervosa. This is a CAT scan of a patient of mine. It's a slice through the head. And you can see over here, these are the ventricles, and this, these are enlarged. The black area represents fluid. And this is what was described in the 80s as cortical atrophy, that the brain actually has shrunk. This is a study that was published in 1994. With the advent of MRI, we were able to quantify some of these changes and show that some of them, the ventricular enlargement was reversible over a prolonged period of time. On your left, there's a, a, a coronal view, that's a view cut through the head in this way, of an 11-year-old with anorexia nervosa. And you can see over here the enlarged ventricles and the increased spaces of CSF around the brain. Compared to on your right, a normal 11-year-old, and if you look at the size of the ventricles, you can see, if I get this pointer working, which is a, it is not, um, that the ventricles are much smaller in the image on your right. Well, we were able to quantify these differences, and here you can see one of the views, and you can see, I'm going to resort to this for a second, if you put a cursor over there, you can measure the volume you can measure the area of that ventricle, and if you know the number of slices, there were 64 slices, you can calculate the volume. And what we found is that in 12 patients with anorexia nervosa, the volumes were increased, and after a period of time of about a year, 11 months, they actually returned to normal. And that is shown over here. On your left in the red, you can see the increased size of the ventricular volume. In the dark blue, you can see at follow-up about 11 months later, and they were not significantly different from controls. So here we've shown that there are some structural changes, um, but that these changes do reverse after nutritional rehabilitation. What was interesting is the relationship between these changes and BMI, which is a measure of malnutrition. And you can see that as BMI increases, so the volume decreases. Put another way, the lower the BMI, the higher the volume. Well, brain consists of two things. It consists of white matter and gray matter. Gray matter comprises primarily the cell bodies, and you can see that over here. And the white matter is the nerves covered by myelin sheaths. And myelin is compo composed predominantly of lipids, which is fatty tissue. And some of our colleagues were able to show that, similar to what we found, that over here, adolescent females um, with, who were, had anorexia nervosa had increased ventricular volumes. Here it's shown in white. It's a different scan, type of scan. It's a 2T image. And on the lower panel, you can see the normal controls. But what they also showed is that they were able to show it's not only the volume of the ventricles, but it's also the white matter and also the gray matter. Gray matter was significantly lower in anorexia and white matter too. They subsequently went on to show that some of the gray matter changes do persist after nutritional rehabilitation. So there was this question, do these structural brain changes reverse completely? So what do we know right now? This is a, subject pub this is a study published in 2003 
17 subjects with anorexia nervosa and 18 controls. And what they found is that when 13 subjects had repeat scans about two months to six months later, there was improvement in the volume, um, but not the, the gray matter volume also was increased. Um, but after weight restoration, most volumes improved, but did not necessarily return entirely to normal. A more recent study, again from the group in Toronto, showed that in 66 subjects who had recovered from an eating disorder six years before, they had developed the eating disorder six years before, they were now recovered, um, they still had persistent structural changes even six years after developing the eating disorder if and when they had low body weight. So there's a question is, is this entirely reversible? We now have the ability to do some much more interesting work with some new technology. And this is something called diffuse tensor imaging and fiber tracking using MRI, where you can actually look at the white matter integrity and function. Um, normally, when you drop a drop of ink on a piece of blotting paper, it diffuses in all directions. But because of myelin sheaths, the diffusion is prevented from going in all directions. It goes in one direction, and that increases the speed of transmission of a neural impulse. And so one can measure the degree of anisotropy. That's the non-diffuse diffusion. And you can develop beautiful pictures like this of some of the white matter tracts. And this is what we're looking to evaluate in young people with anorexia nervosa. And you will see outside there's some handouts of we're looking to study um, 12 subjects with anorexia nervosa between the ages of 14 and 18, and 12 controls, and there's information from the, about that outside. So besides the structural changes, does this impact on function? And the answer is most certainly yes. There's a cerebral cortex that acts on neurotransmitters, such as dopamine and serotonin, and acts on the hypothalamus. I'll resort back to this. And the hypothalamus is really the conductor of this very intricate orchestra. The hypothalamus receives input from fat cells, shown here on the left, via hormones called leptin, acts via some of the neurotransmitters. It also receives input from some of the neuropeptides from the gut. So there are interrelationships between the gut, the fat cells, and the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus acts on the pituitary, the pituitary acts on a number of end organs, including the thyroid, and in anorexia nervosa, for example, we see a low T3 syndrome. This is a way that the thyroid slows down to reduce rest resting energy expenditure and conserve energy. So there are abnormalities in that axis. It acts on the ovaries, and in boys it acts on the testes to get low estrogen levels and low testosterone levels, and that then acts on the bones to cause osteoporosis. It also acts on the adrenal to increase the level of corticosteroids, the stress hormones, which also act then on the bones to cause osteoporosis. But not only that, it also, this hypothalamus controls thermoregulation, body temperature, and people with eating disorders feel cold all the time. It controls water conservation. People with eating disorders have difficulty concentrating urine so that the urine is often dilute. And it also acts on the growth hormone axis. And this is just an example of another study also looking at that axis. I won't bore you with the details other than to say that here again is the anterior pituitary secreting growth hormone, which binds to a receptor called growth hormone binding protein. And we examined that axis to look at growth hormone binding proteins because low levels of that protein signify a state of growth hormone resistance. And what did we show? In 22 subjects with anorexia nervosa, in 28, sorry, and 28 controls, we showed that as we anticipated, levels of growth hormone binding protein were significantly lower than the controls. So here again is an abnormality. It doesn't matter what it is, but it's an abnormality. We showed that that abnormality improves after nutritional rehabilitation and that is not significantly different from controls. And finally, we also showed that this abnormality is directly related to the degree of malnutrition. 
So in summary, I've made the case that eating disorders have a biological predisposition and biological consequences. Many of these consequences are reversible with renutrition and refeeding. Structural brain changes are definitely present at, in low weight patients with anorexia nervosa. Some of these changes are reversible. We're not sure if all of them are. There is a reduction in both gray matter and white matter. And we don't really know the cause of these changes. All right, it's, it's not just fluid shifts because we've corrected for that. It's probably not protein. And one, one of the things that we're looking at, it might be a loss of adipose tissue in the myelin sheets. And that's what we are looking to study. So I hope I've made the case that the brain, biology, and eating disorders are intimately interrelated. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kara Fitzpatrick to you. Dr. Fitzpatrick is a psychologist in the Stanford Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science and Pediatrics. She specializes in neuropsychological assessment of eating disorders and evaluation of treatments for children and adolescents. Her current research interests focus on the development of cognitive remediation therapy or CRT, which utilizes neuropsychological components to address cognitive and behavioral difficulties associated with eating disorders. In addition to working as a therapist on research treatment studies, she also provides supervision to therapists on different treatment modalities. And this evening, Dr. Fitzpatrick will speak on how eating disorders change the adolescent brain. Thanks, Dr. Fitzpatrick. Thanks. So my slides are very plain because I have this slight paranoia of the, my slides not working. Has anybody else ever had that happen? It's really awful. So you won't have as many pre pretty pictures, but you will um, hopefully at least get the understanding of what it is that I'm going for. And that is, just as Dr. Golden sort of elucidated, many of us think about our brain and our body as separate, but in fact they're not. When we lose weight, we lose weight indiscriminately. How many of you guys have been on a diet? Ah, most of you, good Americans. And how many of you lost weight only where you wanted to lose it? <laughs> right? You're like dieting and your fingers are getting thinner or your ankles and you're like, no, 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 that wasn't really what I was going for. Well, the same thing happens in eating disorders. When we lose weight, we're losing weight from our entire body. And our brains, especially healthy brains, especially brains during adolescence, are actually covered in fat. They are the fattiest organ in your body. And that fat is actually critically important. Because as we noted, those, that gray matter, those cell bodies, well, those help with metabolism and energy and they form structures. But those fatty coverings actually help cells communicate quickly with one another. The goal of adolescents, all adolescents, regardless of whether or not they have an eating disorder, is actually to make your brain more efficient. Between the ages of approximately 12 and 24, um, it's actually stimulated a lot by puberty. The whole point of your brain is actually to kill off cells, what we call synapti uh, cell death or apoptosis, and pruning. In other words, this sort of circuit that you have here that you learned that like you were going to be a princess when you grew up, yeah, that's not going to happen. So we're going to let that connection die and we're going to replace it with you're going to become, I don't know, a psychologist. Um, Falling below a healthy weight then, or, and this is really important when we're talking about adolescence, failure to make expected healthy weight gains actually impact brain development. And let me just take one quick moment and say what I mean by failing to make developmental gains. Often what happens in adolescence is not that, that we see such mass, massive or rapid weight loss, although we do see that. Some kids are just growing and changing, but they're not gaining weight. And that actually may be as complex for the brain as, or, or as damaging to the brain as people who are losing weight. When we talk about these changes, you've heard about the structural changes. Well, what does that mean in terms of behavior? And there have really been three broad categories that have been implicated in eating disorders in general. And I'm just going to put them up here and then I'll talk about all of them because I don't expect you to know them. The first is weak central coherence. The second are difficulties in what we call set shifting or cognitive flexibility. And the third has to do with both impulsivity, acting impulsively, um, thinking overly quickly without thinking things through, as well as inhibitory control. Um, 
How many of you guys looked at that cheese outside and went, oh, I just had dinner, but I really like cheese. Should I have that cheese? Should I not have that cheese? That's your impulsivity inhibitory control processes working. Weak central coherence is an aspect of thinking that's characterized by an overly detailed, focused cognitive style. In other words, you pay so much attention to details that you miss the bigger picture. And this is really important because, well, how many of you guys have met adolescents? <laughs> adolescents are actually making that transition between paying attention to the absolute details in things, right? Did I pick out that passage in the scarlet letter that my teacher actually wants me to use versus like what was the point of the book, the scarlet letter? That's balancing that. One is not necessarily better than the other. In fact, for healthy brains, balancing those are important. So knowing when to send that email with the right amount of detail is actually an important part of growing up. When you look at the details instead of the bigger picture, it actually impairs your ability to remember things. It actually keeps you focused on so many details. It's like if you had an organizational structure in your office where you filed things based on what color paper things were printed on rather than the content of what was on those papers. Well, then what would happen if you tried to go recall things? You'd have to remember, oh, yeah, that piece of information I wanted was on the pink paper, but not the rose-colored paper. It'd be a pretty inefficient strategy, right? Well, that's what adolescents with eating disorders appear to be doing. They're adopting a piecemeal structure to things. It impairs integration of information. And so this is always my central coherence task. Some of you guys have seen this. Some of you guys haven't. If you have, don't, don't give it away. Where's the face in the coffee bean? Raise your hand when you see it. Ah, you cheater. <laughs> I have to look up here and see if I can see them. Oh, I see them. People with weak central coherence, people who have a detail focus, see the face in the coffee beans much better than people who are balancing between the big picture and not. So some of you guys are giggling. Come on, nobody's hands are going up except for Stacy's. And that's because Stacy's seen this before. So you see them? You think maybe that's his nose, and those are his eyeballs, and that's his nice little round dome of a head? OK, wait, 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 guys. Now that you can see him, how many of you have a hard time not seeing him? OK, so now that you see him, he's hard to get away from. And that actually brings us to um, set shifting, which I'll talk about in just one second. Set shifting actually refers to the ability to think flexibly. Now, that sounds like something you guys are like, well, do I think flexibly or not? You move between ideas, concepts, thoughts, images all the time. In fact, it's the basis of problem solving. So everyone who came here tonight had to do some set shifting because any way that you would normally get here is now blocked, right? <laughs> and any sort of framework you had for how you were going to park was probably completely disrupted by signs that say, whoops, this driveway doesn't work, right? Well, you had to manage that information. You had to think of another route to get here. When you go home, you're going to have to remember where you parked your car. That's maybe not where you usually park your car. Well, what happens when we have poor set shifting? Poor set shifting leads to behavioral and cognitive rigidity, very black and white thinking. If you can only get one place one way, when those signs go up blocking that driveway, you're in really big trouble. Well, it also leads to perfectionistic and perseverative behaviors. If you only know one way to solve a problem, then you're going to keep hammering at that problem with your hammer. But if your problem's not a nail, you're in big trouble. What's even more interesting is that set shifting really forms the basis of social and communication behaviors. I'm standing here talking to all of you, and you're doing something in your head that we, we might call multitasking or parallel processing. While I'm talking, you're thinking about what this information means to you, how it might have been relevant to someone you knew, both personally or abstractly, how it fits with what Dr. Golden presented. And social communication is fundamentally a set-shifting behavior. 
you're taking on my mindset as I explain this behavior to, these behaviors to you. And we're having a shared experience. Well, if you can't move flexibly or fluidly, your social communication is going to be caught up in you thinking what you're thinking. And that other person's views or thoughts coming in are going to be harder to hold on to. So what does set shifting look like in eating disorders? In eating disorders, interestingly, we used to think that both adolescents and adults had similar set shifting difficulties. But actually what we find now, in actually looking at adolescents, that was novel, is that adolescents actually seem to have fewer difficulties, adolescents with eating disorders have fewer difficulties in set shifting than adults with more chronic anorexia do. And so in other words, these difficulties seem to develop over the course of illness. Or said another way, they may actually be a scar of the illness over time. It may be that kids who develop anorexia during adolescence are failing to get on this trajectory where these skills are developed. Because remember, adolescence is a time where these skills are developing. If we're malnourished, we may in fact be moving our brain off of that trajectory that goes like this, where these skills would be developing, and instead you stay at a less mature level. Does that make sense to everyone? OK. What about impulsivity and inhibitory control? Well, the reason why I put both of these up here when they're sort of opposite ends of the spectrum is that this seems to be a piece that distinguishes the behavior of adolescents with anorexia from the behavior of adolescents with bulimia nervosa. Those with anorexia nervosa have greater inhibitory control. In fact, I would argue they have such good inhibitory control that it's actually a bad thing. We often think about inhibitory control as really good, don't we? Right? That's why people say things like, I'd like to have just a touch of anorexia. No, you don't. Um, but we value inhibitory control. We value being able to say no. Adolescents with anorexia nervosa appear to be able to say no to so many things that they're actually possibly not even aware of them, like the urge to eat, the urge to become warm, the urge to rest. Those may actually be pushed past with this desire to inhibit. Where folks who develop bulimia nervosa first seem to have poor inhibitory control. In other words, they're more impulsive, or at least on some tasks, they're more impulsive. And so this is both cognitive impulsivity, the thoughts, right? Because what you think isn't, uh, I mean, I hope that what you think isn't always what you do. Would you all agree on that? Good. Um, if, if it was, we'd have a problem with your behavior, right? So there's cognitive impulsivity, and then there's also behavioral or response impulsivity, what you actually do. So you may have had the thought, I want the cheese, but you didn't eat it. <laughs> or you may have actually had the thought, I want the cheese, and you ate the cheese. That would be actually more characterized by somebody with bulimia nervosa. Anorexia nervosa would be like, what cheese? There was cheese? I didn't see the cheese. Central coherence I left toward later because one of the things that we know is that central coherence difficulties actually seem to exist in adolescents as well as adults, but not in exactly the same way. So remember that slide where you were finding that little guy's face? You know, that task is hard for everybody. <laughs> I put it up there just to make it challenging for all of you. But what we find is that adolescents with weak central coherence actually perform poorly relative to healthy controls on integrating or putting together visual spatial puzzles. That picture was a bit like a puzzle, wasn't it? How many of, how did, how many of you guys approached it by going across and looking at all the beans uh, like, they were like they were rows? A couple of you. How about columns? OK, I'm dying to know what other search strategies you guys used. Looking for something that looked like a face and then not finding it? Yeah. Uh, I have to be focusing my eye. Uh, uh, like a magic eye puzzle. Yeah, people always think that it's going to be some sort of 3D hologram where the guy jumps out. Unfocusing your eyes, that's actually another really good one because we've been trained by those puzzles that don't look like anything and supposedly have pictures. I've never been able to do one. I don't know why. What we find, though, is that for adolescents, the difficulty in finding that particular piece may not be as impaired as it is in adults with chronic anorexia, but they do have low level, what we call central coherence difficulties, in putting together pictures, in seeing the whole 
um, in following sort of a train or seeing what the parts are in order to build something. So it's a little bit more complicated. Set shifting seems like you didn't develop the skills you were supposed to develop or that, those, that weaknesses in set shifting developed as a result of illness. But for central coherence, it appears that we may have a baseline difficulty in integrating visual spatial material that also is impacted by illness, either through failure to develop or as a consequence of illness. Now, why might this matter? Your body, to you, is nothing more than a puzzle. Your brain has actually mapped out your body like a big puzzle in your brain, like a big 3D puzzle in your brain. And what is one of the core symptoms that we see in anorexia nervosa? It's a distortion in that understanding of the body. And central coherence may actually relate specifically to these challenges. These may be what we call pre-morbid or risk factors, something we've taken to calling endophenotypes or inherited characteristics that demonstrate as a behavior. Now, if we put it all together, what do we do about it? Now, if you came in here and told me you had liver disease, and I said, OK, we're going to go home and have you scrub your feet three times a day really well so they're nice and clean, you would think I was a little nuts, right? None of you are nodding. <laughs> I would hope you would think I was a little nuts. If you have a problem with your brain, why wouldn't we target the brain? And some people think that that's what therapy is. But therapy is a verbal modality, right? What we found is actually you can target development in the brain. You can actually create tasks that give your brain a workout. So you remember those beautiful, almost peacock-like images that Dr. Golden put up? We can make those images prettier, make those tracts stronger, by engaging in tasks that have nothing to do with food or eating at all. And so what we're actually doing is giving your brain a workout. It's like a core workout for your head. Because your brain is very plastic. I don't mean like a Barbie doll. I mean that it's very responsive to environmental changes. So when you guys were all driving here and you couldn't find where you would usually park or all the driveways were blocked, what'd you do? <laughs> Louder, somebody. Try the next street. You were, <laughs> you were doing this. <laughs> driving around and around in circles. You were using a mental map. You were going back to the directions we sent you. Well, think about this. You were practicing set shifting. You were actually practicing a set of behaviors that change your brain. And we found that we can change brains, even very damaged brains, even brains of people with traumatic brain injury who've lost sections of their brain, to, to have the other parts of their brain take over that function. Well, with anorexia nervosa, we're not as worried. With bulimia nervosa, we're not as worried. These are brains that are fundamentally intact. And we're training them in order to be able to address other parts or get what we call a workaround. So once you saw that face, and it was kind of hard not to see that face, that was also a set shifting task. You changed. In that moment when you saw them, you guys all had kind of like a little bit of an aha moment, yeah? That aha moment was set shifting. And we practiced it in a way that wasn't intimidating or upsetting to you. And we do this in cognitive remediation therapy with tasks that don't relate to eating disorders because of one sort of basic feature of human learning. When you have the daylight scared out of you, you are a lousy learner. Did you know that? Anybody here ever had a traumatic car accident or anything else like that? Afterwards? You kind of know what happened, probably because people told you, but do you really remember the details? There might be one or two that stand out. But you're kind of fuzzy or hazy. Well, that's because your amygdala, this part of your brain that searches for threat, it's a very healthy part of your brain, actually, pulls all of your attention toward a threat. So if I'm talking to you about avocados, you are going to be paying attention to the fat content of that avocado if you have an eating disorder. You're not going to be paying attention to the nutritional content, the fact that the fats in them are the perfect fats for your brain when we talk about um, renourishing your brain. Remember that? And needing those lipids? Well, guess what? Avocados just smear it all over your beautiful cells, in your, or actually your myelin sheath, and that would be very, very happy. So one of the things that we're trying to do is trying to create not only an understanding of what the behaviors look like, but also what we can do about it. And that's what CRT does. In a non-threatening environment, we teach your brain how to think differently. 
And so eating disorders, just to summarize, are associated with both structural and functional changes in the brain. These manifest in behaviors that we see. Instead of just targeting the behaviors, we want to target the process. And we're now able to know that we can back up and change the process, function, and even structure of your brain. We haven't done this yet in, um, in anorexia, but in schizophrenia, we can find that in as few as eight sessions, we can actually get changes in the structure of your brain. And these are brains that have far more impact from disease than anorexia nervosa. So this is clearly very promising work. Um, this also sets the basis for therapy. Because if you can't shift your set, if you can't change your mind, therapy is going to be really, really painful for both you and the therapist. Wouldn't you agree? And if all you see are the details and you can't see how they fit into the big picture, you're never going to be able to put yourself in space and time and notice patterns, habits, consequences, or antecedents for that matter. All of which, when we think about the basis of cognitive therapies for people or behavioral therapies, are critical for helping to learn. So it may actually be that cognitive remediation therapy sets the brain up in a healthy way to be able to make the kinds of changes that it needs to make to ultimately recover. Said differently, these are the right skills for adolescent brains at the right time that they are developing them. And it's a very exciting time to be an adolescent brain. Thank you. Dr. James Locke is going to speak with us next. He's psychiatric director of the Comprehensive Eating Disorder Program. He's a professor at the Stanford Department of Psych Psychiatry and Behavioral Science and Pediatrics. Dr. Locke is a board certified child and adolescent uh, psychiatrist specializing in the treatment of children and adolescents with eating disorders. He's a nationally and internationally recognized expert in the psychiatric treatment of children and adolescent with e adolescents with eating disorders, and he's the author of numerous articles and many books, including Treatment Manual for Anorexia Nervosa, A Family-Based Approach, Help Your Teenager Beat an Eating Disorder, Treating Bulimia in Adolescents, A Family-Based Approach. Dr. Locke will now present does an impulsive or inhibited cognitive style contribute to eating disorders? Neural correlates of cognitive inhibition in adolescents with eating disorders. Thank you so much, Dr. Locke. Thank you. Um, so you may have noticed that the talks are kind of becoming more and more focused. We talk about the structure of the brain and the basic biology and then uh, Dr. Fitzpatrick talks a little bit about the um, processes of, uh, uh, and cognitive style, uh, and um, so they're building on one another. And this particular talk is about uh, a neuroimaging or functional imaging study looking at one of the particular areas that um, Dr. Fitzpatrick described about cognitive inhibition and cognitive control. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge the funding for this study uh, from Lucille Packard Children's Hospital Unrestricted <laughs> Research Funds. Um, these funds um, are available to those of us who work on the faculty, and they come from uh, families and um, uh, other contributors to Lucille Packard, and we appreciate those because they allow us to do the kind of pilot research which um, uh, will hopefully lead to larger and more definitive studies uh, funded by um, other bodies. Uh, Dr. Amy Garrett, uh, who uh, is the expert in neuroimaging, who helped us with this study. Judy Beenhocker was the, my research assistant on this study. And Dr. Reese, uh, an international, uh, internationally known neuroimaging um, expert in child psychiatry, was an important consultant in understanding the study. So why is cognitive inhibition important in eating disorders? First of all, um, uh, Dr. Fitzpatrick described this to a certain extent. Behavior and personality characteristics um, differ among patients with eating disorders depending on the subtype. Now, um, one of the things that uh, those, of who are, those of us who work with younger patients with anorexia and bulimia uh, recognize is although there may be a few patients who have overlapping symptoms of bulimia and anorexia, by far the majority initially present with one or the other disorders. And over time, with chronicity, you see more emerging. So 
one of the important things is to look early enough in the um, development of the disorder to look at, uh, to see if there are different uh, patterns uh, in the brain and behaviors. So patients with binge eating and purging behaviors, such as anorexia, binge purge type, and bulimia nervosa, have these impulsive and disinhibited uh, personality characteristics in a relative sense. Um, so uh, clinically, uh, when we treat patients with um, bulimia, I always I used to tell the story about this. I, when I would go on the ward before, um, when the patients were in a group or something, I could go to their rooms and I could often anticipate the diagnosis of the patient just by walking in the room. Because the anorexic patients, there would be a sort of stack of books on the table and maybe uh, a, a, a pen and paper on the, on the, on the table. I went to the bulimic adolescence room, there would be Abercrombie and Fitch posters, and, you know, on a big heart-filled, name-colored thing with uh, all their friends from school because they're much more engaged in normal adolescent uh, risk-taking behaviors uh, compared to the, um, um, ad many of the anorexic patients. Instead of that overly controlled, perfectionistic, driven style, um, the, although there still are perfectionistic tendencies in the patients with bulimia, they, ha they were more normally in adolescence and had this other um, these other characteristics. Over time, um, you also see that these, these personality characteristics may also contribute to people's response to treatment. Um, patients with bulimia tend to not want to continue the behavior. They see it as a problematic behavior. And although they may feel trapped by it and want to continue it because they don't know what else to do, they are not really happy with continuing it typically. Whereas the person with anorexia is much more ambivalent or downright convinced that they should continue doing uh, their restrictive dieting and over-exercise which maintain the behavior. So you have these different kinds of patterns of managing um, even treatment. Um, there have been, a f uh, in, the, in the world of studies of anorexia nervosa, you might have noticed that, and bulimia nervosa, that there are um, relatively few studies, both of the brain, as it turns out, and also of treatments and so forth. Um, many of the studies that were cited are um, older studies or studies that are small in numbers, you know, 12, 15, and things like this. That's because it's very difficult to um, conduct these studies and also there's expense involved, but also just the relative availability of funds to conduct the studies um, are, have not been available. However, there have been a couple. Um, Rachel March, who's at Columbia, um, is a, is a neuropsychologist uh, there, and she did a study of adults uh, with bulimia nervosa, and in her study, she had them do a task associated with uh, being able to um, inhibit your behavioral response, uh, something called the Simon task, and she found that looking at brain images, she uh, could detect differences between those with bulimia and controls, and those with bulimia had, in her studies using that task, lower levels of activation, suggesting uh, that those patients had less resources being applied to inhibit, uh, and therefore, in her theory, less ability to inhibit uh, uh, responses. Um, she also more recently published a study that replicated that in adolescents uh, with bulimia. Um, We were interested in using, we used a different task. We were interested in um, looking at patients who had bulimia or binge purge subtype anorexia versus just pure restricting to see whether using a different cognitive control task um, there would be differences on, on functional neuroimaging. We predicted uh, based on these studies that we would find evidence of excessive inhibition in the anorexic subtypes and uh, compared to healthy controls and to the binge, those with binging and purging. So um, we had the wonderful resources of Stanford University and the 3TGE Cigna Excite Magnet. Um, uh, we used a, something called a rapid jittered event-related no-go task. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and you push a button to, to, to <coughs> until you get a signal that you're not supposed to. And if you then you push it, then you're going to get a, a, a different kind of mistake signal. And uh, the more of those mistakes you make, and the functional correlates on your brain. That's what we're going to look at. So that's the scanner. 
That's the second scanner today. If you want to see one live, I guess maybe most many of you might have seen one. So this is the go no go task. You see, you push for all. You push the button for all but X. So L M T V, and then you you have to not push for that X. And if you push for that X, you you're gonna. Uh, that's when you're going to be you're going to be scanned during those times, and we can look for differences in that. And the reason you do that um, loading with those letters is because you, uh, those of you who get in, you know this from habits. You know, so the idea is to get kind of a, uh, a prepotent response so that you're kind of pushing towards getting that response. So you actually have to actively stop yourself from pushing that button. So we had 14 um, <coughs> patients with um, anorexia restrictive type, um, 13 uh, with binge purge uh, disorder, either anorexic or, or bulimia. Most of them were um, bulimics, um, and 13 healthy controls. Um, and their average age was uh, 15, 17, and 16. And um, I, I put that there because Kara pointed out that during adolescence, the brain is uh, uh, developing, that you have uh, changes in structural as well as functional components of the brain. So this difference, these differences in age 15, 17, and 16 might be a difference. We did control for those differences. Um, and we did find uh, that, uh, of course, weight would differ because anorexia patients tended to be lower weight. Um, and of course, benching and purging was present in a group. Um, in the uh, task itself, um, uh, there were no differences in the groups, so that everyone could inhibit equally. And this is actually something we kind of des desired, because if you have a different behavioral um, outcome, uh, that will, uh, could potentially make your results harder to interpret. Since they all had the same behavioral response, when you're looking at function, you're looking at difference at, in the neural correlates of the function. So the fMRI results showed that within each group, right, inferior, and middle frontal gyri were activated during the uh, uh, response inhibition task, that is when you don't press when observing X compared to successful response in the no-go. That meant that we knew, we were looking at that part of the brain and we were looking at that was, we activated the parts of the brain we wanted to. The binge purge group showed right dorsal caudate and, and anterior cingulate activation and widespread frontal activation. I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. Whereas the anorexia nervosa restricting type showed anterior cingulate activation but not caudate activation. So if you, I don't know if this pointer works. <coughs> I'm guessing not. It does. All right. So, so if you look at the three groups, um, these are the healthy controls. These are the bench parts of types, and these are the anorexics. And so, what's what's striking about this is the just the color, right? Which one has the most color? This one. So, and whereas these two are pretty similar in terms of both the regions that are activated and the degree of activation. Um, if you just look at the things. So in our, uh, during, the sa during the same task, right, uh, for the same periods of time, the, the bench purge uh, group a activated more parts of the brain. And so this was different than what Marsh had found, where she found decreased activation. Um, uh, and one of the reasons it could be different is the task is different. Um, but fundamentally, there is a difference, and the, the, the correlates of that difference in terms of magnitude are pretty great. We interpret it this way, that the person with bulimia is in, has a tendency to be disinhibited and using more executive functioning um, areas of the brain to inhibit the response. So that's where you see greater activation. So that's how our, our interpretation of those things. Um, and so this is additional uh, recruitment of re brain regions and or discrepant brain activation patterns leading to this, um, so that they could still get the task done. Remember, they got the task done just as well as somebody else. They just used more brain to do it. Um, the, the, it's interesting, the, the findings of increased hypothalamic activation suggest some aberrant responses in the region associated with emotional function. So there may be an emotional coloring towards this need to inhibit, um, and that might be um, uh, important in understanding in future studies uh, how to manage that particular aspect of the findings. So this is just a picture of what, what parts of the brain were activated. That's the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and the interior cingulate uh, regions. 
in the hypothalamus. So one of the things that we didn't find was that there was a large difference between, there were no differences in, uh, statistically between the um, anorexics and the controls. So that our other hypothesis that anorexia nervosa would show increased in ability to inhibit and, inhibit and therefore have a different neural correlate wasn't found. Um, but we did see this increased activation in uh, the occipital area, which is um, uh, associated with uh, brain uh, region and visual processing, and it may have to do with attention to detail, which, which has to do with this central co coherence and efficiency that uh, Carol was talking about. So these findings uh, support the hypothesis that there are differences in neural function um, between anorexia restricting type and binge purge type, um, and that these, uh, these differences um, are also different from healthy controls. Um, this increased activation pattern, as I said, um, is in the prefrontal cortex and executive control region, which is under development during adolescence. And so if you think about what is adolescence about, it's about learning to, for most kids, learning how to inhibit properly um, so that you aren't going to be lost in your impulsive behaviors. But for an anorexic who may get stuck at this lower um, developmental, or not younger developmental stage, it may be important to be boost their uh, disinhibition. Um, so these findings, the, the adolescents here were stable enough to be in an outpatient setting to have the scanner. Um, so they were partially, they weren't severely malnourished and, um, and they also are younger patients with short duration illness. And what's interesting about this is these findings, um, if replicated in um, a larger study, might give us some way of having a biomarker for change um, of treatment, whether you use something like cognitive remediation, which Kara was describing, or other treatments. Um, and so one of the elements of working with, with cognitive remediation therapy that we have um, uh, been, been excited about is developing modules about inhibitory control, which we have, which have not traditionally been part of the um, CRT um, strategies used with adults. Um, we are uh, now um, in a set of um, late adolescents and young adults looking at data we collected on neural correlates of, of um, set shifting and central coherence. So those very things that Kara described um, in terms of the um, overall uh, functional differences between eating disordered patients and those without. We're going to be looking at these, um, uh, the neural correlates of these. Um, we are also doing a study on family aggregation of these cognitive processes. So how far from the tree does the apple fall on set shifting and central coherence um, uh, tasks? And um, we are just finishing a study uh, of cognitive remediation therapy for late adolescents and young adults. Um, and we know that, that the treatment um, was um, acceptable and um, patients liked it, uh, and also that it seems to have had um, uh, differential effects on uh, central coherence and, and um, cognitive inefficiencies. So with that, I'll stop, and thank you. It's now my pleasure to... Um introduce to you Dr. Cynthia Capon, who's medical director of the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital Comprehensive Eating Disorders Program. She is a clinical associate professor in the Division of Adolescent Medicine at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. Capon is a board certified pediatrician and adolescent medicine specialist with over 15 years of clinical experience managing the medical aspects of eating disorders in adolescents. Uh, her research and advocacy interests focus on ensuring adolescents have access to appropriate medical and mental health services to meet their special needs. She's the author of many articles related to the health of adolescents. And Dr. Capon's presentation title for this evening is From Individual to Family-Centered Care for Eating Disorders at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Thanks, Dr. Capon. Sorry, I didn't jump, did I? There you are. Sorry about that. 
Well, it's, a, it's a privilege to be here. We're, we're going to do a little set shifting now uh, in my talk as well. Uh, we've heard a lot about the research that's going on in brains at the Children's Hospital and the impact of eating disorders on brains. But the Children's Hospital has also been at the forefront of work on family-centered therapy. Dr. Locke is one of the leaders in bringing this approach to the United States. Uh, Dr. fitzpatrick has been working along with him in doing research into that as well. And we've really embraced that approach at the Children's Hospital and worked very hard to integrate this evidence-based, very strong approach to treatment into our work with adolescents in the inpatient, outpatient settings. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our program and give you some background on how it's evolved over time. And then I'm also going to give you a little bit of background about the theoretical framework and how we've incorporated a new framework and model into our care here at the Children's Hospital. A little bit of historical context. Our program has been around for a very long time. In, in 1979, it was started with Dr. Hans Steiner and Dr. Iris Litt. And this was a really very progressive way of treating eating disorders at the time. It was very unusual to have a merging of psychiatric and medical care. It was very progressive. And these two individuals came together and they wanted to work together to uh, improve the health of adolescents with eating disorders and developed a whole program around that. It was a program that involved primarily inpatient treatment. Adolescents were here for literally months getting treatment in this program. There was a lot of resources within the hospital for that, but there wasn't a lot of outpatient treatment beyond that time. So adolescents were really taken into the program, received a lot of therapy and treatment in the program, and separated from their families during that time. We moved to the new hospital here in 1990, and our treatment at that time became more medically focused. We had a, still a very active psychiatric component to that that was milieu-based. Length of stays decreased to about a month, still a very long period of time though. We had more outpatient medical follow-up that was developed at that time, but the opportunities for outpatient psychiatric care were still somewhat limited. We grew too big for our program to stay here and had the opportunity to move off-site in 2003 and have really been able to expand our program quite significantly since that time. We have a, had an average length of stay when we moved down there, uh, about more around 12 to 14 days, still very focused on medical stabilization of the youth, but having a lot of other opportunities within the program to work on some of the psychiatric issues as well. And during that time, we also expanded our outpatient psychiatric options, as well as continuing our medical services for eating disordered adolescents. We moved to the new El Camino Hospital in 2007, and it's just, it's really a gorgeous unit. We've been able to build the whole unit around the milieu, and uh, particularly around wanting to incorporate families more into the treatment process at, at that new unit. We still continue to provide full medical services, including, including cardiac monitoring for the youth. It's a very supportive and supervised therapeutic setting. Some of the nurses have literally been there for, for years and decades working with youth and are very focused on knowing how to support individuals that are struggling with this, with this problem. And the average length of stay has decreased significantly down to nine days. And we have extremes. There's adolescents that are there just for a few days, and we have some very, very sick adolescents that are there for weeks now as well. I wanted to show you some pictures of the unit. On the upper left side, we've got our dining room. Uh, initially, children will be on their beds, but then as they improve in their medical condition, they're able to come and do more group activities together. We actually have a school on site. The Mountain View School District has a teacher that's part of the school district, so adolescents can even get credit for work that is done during their hospitalization. We have a gorgeous patio that the nurses have really worked hard to put together and is a place where a lot of families congregate and have meals with their children um, during the stay. Uh, and the bottom right corner is one of the activity rooms. We've got a nurse that's very passionate about doing art projects with the kids. And we also have an art therapist that works a lot in, in expressing themselves through art. We continue to be a medically-based program. It's a med psych program. All of the adolescents and young adults who are in our program are there because they're medically unstable. And I just wanted to review some of the criteria that we use for hospitalization. 
just being at a very severely low uh, body weight is sufficient enough reason to be in our program. There's a lot of medical complications that come from being severely malnourished, so that's one of the criteria. Any one of these is sufficient uh, for hospitalization. The body is very affected by nutritional deficits, either through purging or through undernutrition. So oftentimes we'll see the body kind of going into a hibernation mode. You can get low heart rate, low temperature, low blood pressure. When people go from lying to standing position, oftentimes their blood pressure will drop or their heart will start to race. Any of those signs are, uh, are significant and show that the body's under stress from the nutritional deficits and can be alone a reason for hospitalization. Sometimes as well we see people with significant problems with their blood work, um, low potassium levels or phosphorus. If those are significantly out of range, that can be a criteria for admission. Sometimes the cardiac effects can be one of the things that we worry the most about. If there's significant changes with that, we would not want an individual to be hospitalized. Or if there's any sort of acute medical complication, having a fainting episode, cardiac issues, seizures related to the eating issues is also a reason to, for hospitalization. When we get to the bottom one, sometimes it's, it's you, know, you decide whether it needs to be in the inpatient or outpatient setting, but severe dehydration or acute food refusal or arrested growth or development are sometimes reasons for hospitalization as well on the medical side. There's other additional criteria for hospitalization at a psychiatric facility, but again, ours is a medically based unit, and so all of the individuals that are hospitalized there have some significant medical reason why they need to be in an inpatient setting. We hope that we see patients before they become so medically unstable that they need to be in the hospital. And we also have a very active and strong outpatient treatment program. We do new patient evaluations either as a one-time assessment where we give feedback to the treatment team in the community or as a way to initiate ongoing care within our, our institution. The patient comes for a full day evaluation and includes individual and family assessments, a nutritional assessment, and then an adolescent medicine assessment as well. And we've listed our intake coordinator's number on the bottom, and I think we have some pamphlets outside if anybody's interested in more information. We have an outpatient eating disorder clinic uh, that's staffed by an adolescent medicine physicians, nutrition, and social worker. And we also have a very active outpatient child psychiatry department where a number of different modalities are offered, including family-based therapy, individual psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and the cognitive remediation therapy that Dr. Fitzpatrick was talking about. I wanted to talk a little bit about how we've shifted in our focus over time. When I first got here, Do Dr. Locke and I have been here uh, almost 20 years now, actually, and it's, it's very, our treatment, our whole focus of treatment, going on 20, we're getting there, uh, has, has really changed. When we first came here, it was very patient-focused. We really saw, saw the family not really as an ally and in some cases actually kind of as a cause for the eating disorder. Uh, we emphasized a lot in our treatment patient autonomy, independence, and the, the long hospitalizations were common and we removed the adolescent from the family to do the treatment and sort of where it was the authorities that were doing the treatment. And then, but then after discharge, there was kind of a sink or swim approach to it. We've shifted radically to a whole different way of looking at eating disorders and really now view the family as the adolescent's best ally in treating and overcoming illness. We emphasize family support and involvement and really empowering parents to try to help their child overcome the illness. We try to minimize hospitalization whenever possible or even eliminate it and try to do all of our treatment in the outpatient setting if it's medically safe. And then we, we work with the family to try to get them empowered so that they're able to structure meal times at home, support the patient after discharge, and really normalize the eating patterns and activity for their young child or adolescent. There's been a number of reasons why we've changed our focus in the program. The one is really just looking as uh, from, instead of being an etiologic agent, as really being an ally in the, the care of an adolescent or a, even young adults. This actually works quite well with young adults as well as with teens. We were concerned about the long hospitalizations and the impact on adolescent health and development. And we also found that patients and families often floundered with the old model. They didn't know what to do after transitioning to the home environment. And we wanted them to be included more in the care during hospitalization so there was an easier transition back home. Also, there was significant scientific research coming out, um, 
primarily through Dr. Locke's uh, research program, showing that the family-centered care was really not only as good, but even better than the individual approach to, to treatment in most cases. So we wanted to incorporate that <coughs> evidence base into our own model of care at the Children's Hospital. And finally, there's been some really significant changes in insurance funding over time. There's not a lot of resources for inpatient care. Uh, it can be very uh, expensive to treat an individual with eating disorders, and we wanted to try to make this as cost-effective as possible and shift most of the care whenever possible to the outpatient setting to reduce hospital costs and individual out-of-pocket costs as well. Our current program at the Children's Hospital really tries to focus on empowering and involving families uh, throughout the hospitalization. When a, a child is admitted to our program, we provide written materials for the family. We've got a program orientation booklet, and we actually distribute Dr. Locke's book to families, and they, they found it very helpful. We have medical and psychiatric staff and a dietitian that meet with the family initially to do an initial assessment and then throughout the stay uh, to provide education and support during the hospitalization. We have a health educator that also is very involved in educating families and in particular working, since we have such short stays, we really need to be looking forward to discharge, working with the families to make sure that they've identified resources for transitioning after care to continue care as an outpatient. Families have at least three family meals during the hospitalization, and our very experienced nursing staff is, is present and tries to model. Oftentimes, there's been a lot of struggles about meals at home, and so to have some modeling of appropriate support during the hospitalization so that the families can feel more empowered again to be doing the feedings themselves, and then ultimately we transition the feeds over to the, the families. There's a parent support group that's available during and after the hospital stay, and we work hard to work with families during the time, and particularly just before transition to the outpatient setting, to make sure everybody's got a solid discharge plan in place and that they understand what's really expected of them after transitioning back home. There's a lot of us that work together with families and adolescents uh, throughout the hospitalization, adolescent medicine physicians, nurse practitioner, child psychiatrists and psychologists. We've got great nursing staff social worker, health educator, and our school teacher as well. Uh, we have a case manager that works a lot. There's oftentimes many insurance hurdles that families encounter when getting treatment for their child with, that, with an eating disorder, so we work very actively uh, to help with that as well. We've got a great dietitian, unit clerks, recreation therapy, occupational uh, therapist, physical therapist, art therapist, everybody works together in the unit, and we actually have team-based meetings every day during the week to talk about the care of each individual patient and formulate a good plan of care for that patient each day. And the most precious resource, though, is you all. Um, that really, there's no other better advocate for their child than the family of somebody who's struggling with this illness. Um, and we look forward to working with you if you're, if you're dealing with this issue in your family. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fon. Um, if anyone else has questions at this point, if you want to lift your card up and um, they'll be collected. I'm going to thank you all for this uh, fascinating set of presentations. Um, uh, I, I, please note that there is an evaluation form in your folder. So as our uh, physicians are coming up to the table here to um, answer questions, you can fill it out now or fill it out during the panel, but we would like to uh, collect that from you before you leave uh, this evening. Now, uh, I'd also like to introduce for a moment uh, yes. Deborah Schlesinger from the Eating Disorders Resource Center who has come this evening to uh, give you a little information about this important resource. Are you here, Deborah? How are you? I can see you. Come on. as long as I can see. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Deborah Schlesinger, and since 2008, I have been a volunteer with the Eating Disorder Resource Center, the EDRC, located in Campbell. As the go-to place for information and support on eating disorders, we promote recovery by connecting individuals to resources, treatment, and support groups. We advocate for mental 
health legislation, and effective insurance coverage. Our online directory provides a comprehensive list of local resources. The EDRC is the only nonprofit in Silicon Valley providing these services. We are pleased to include Lucille Packard's Children's Hospital among our growing family of partners. We appreciate their generous funding of our efforts over the last five years. A special thank you to Candace Roney and Karen Kemby, who share our vision. They have been there for us and founder Janice Brennis from the very beginning. A special thanks as well to Dr. Jim Locke and the clinical postdoctoral team, to Drs. Capon and Golden for helping us educate health professionals on appropriate screening for eating disorders. One of our primary goals is to reach healthcare professionals at every clinic, hospital, nonprofit organization, and schools throughout the Silicon Valley. And lastly, as part of our National Eating Disorders Awareness Week, you are all invited to a complimentary lunch at the Campbell Community Center tomorrow at 11.30. For more details on Need a Week and our services, please visit our website at www.edrcsv.org and be sure to join our mailing list at our educational table outside. In recognition of Need a Week, let's remember everybody knows somebody. Thank you very much. goal is to sort of sort the cards into groups, but um, is that sort of what we have here? Okay. Um, so we have, um, we have questions here about can a person have anorexia and bulimia at the same time? Mm -hmm. um, well, so, so when you're doing, uh, the, the diagnostic groupings are anorexia nervosa, which requires low weight, the recommended threshold of a, uh, lower than about 85% of expected mean for age and gender and height, um, and you can have a binging and purging presentation. If you're above that and you're binging and purging, then you will be diagnosed with bulimia. And I think we have several questions here for Dr. Fitzpatrick. Uh, uh, um, where can you find practitioners of CRT? What's the likelihood of fully recovering uh, with this help and preventing relapse? And what is neuropsych testing as related <laughs> to eating disorders? Okay. Um, can I address those in reverse order? Neuropsych yeah. testing as it relates to eating disorders is actually neuropsychological tests are tests that have been studied on wide um, populations. So they're the same kinds of tests we use on people with a healthy people and people with a variety of disorders that let us compare certain types of behaviors and from that extrapolate to certain parts of the brain. Um, <clears throat> there's no real standard for what we use. The tasks we use um, in our lab um, are some of the internationally agreed upon standards. What we wanted were batteries that we could look at functioning from ages 8 to 88 because that kind of makes sense, right? To be able to look across the lifespan. Um, neuropsych testing is essentially a way of looking at the brain without popping the hood. You can see from a behavior what's going on on the inside of the brain. Um, so that's the question about neuropsych. Can you remind me just really quickly, what's the likelihood of getting cognitive remediation therapy? Yes. Um, and where can you find practice? practitioners. So far, this is really just a novel treatment that's still being studied. Um, we just completed a, a large, well, for anorexia, large trial um, that Dr. Locke alluded to, which should be coming out fairly shortly. Um, it does exist in a manualized form, and it's increasingly interest, uh, there's increasing interest in other groups doing that. In terms of it being widely available, I think we're a few years away from that. Um, I'm going to the, open the last question to everyone here because I think it really relates, and that is, what's the likelihood that people will truly recover from an eating disorder? And I have to say, that's 
always our goal. I would never want to leave anyone with partial recovery, just like I wouldn't want to leave you with just a little bit of your cancer um, or just a little bit of your liver disease. Um, the likelihood, well, what we know is that basically recovery, uh, onset tends to happen during adolescence and so does recovery. So we really have a big push to get people early on in treatment um, and to address all of the things that people need to get back onto that, what we call normal developmental trajectory. Um, I think I'd yeah, like so to leave some of those answers to, the, to you guys. So w one of the things that um, has made, made, made this question relevant is this was a long time a kind of idea that no one recovered from anorexia nervosa or eating disorders that you just would have them forever. But in fact, um, that, that I think is a, a mistake and it's taken from a, uh, the perspective of looking only at chronically ill adults with what these disorders who who, like for many chronic illnesses, recovery may not be the goal. But when you have someone who hasn't been ill very long, right, under two to three years, depending on the treatment they receive and probably some other constitutional factors, recovery can occur and does occur. In a study we just did uh, com com comparing um, two different treatments for anorexia nervosa, those who got family-based treatment um, were fully recovered in the sense that they didn't have any differences in their eating-related concerns or their weight from normal peers and were on a growth and behavioral trajectory uh, that was, um, for, for all intents and purposes, normal. And that was maintained in the follow-up period that we to date. So that's in very encouraging. If, if, if you think about in, um, most psychiatric disorders, depression or anxiety disorders, for example, or schizophrenia, you will not get those kind of recovery rates. So they're, they're, So it's very encouraging if we get at it early and we get the right kind of treatment um, uh, effectively administered that you really can get full recovery. If, if I can just endorse that as well, um, the recovery rates from a number of studies in adolescence is very different from that in adults, and it's really the shorter duration of illness probably so the sooner we get people into treatment, the better. And I think that, that should be the message we all take home. We have several questions here on the precursors. I think we have okay. um, On the precursors and understanding the precursors of anorexia nervosa and um, triggers and when does it become active and at what point in development of, anore of anorexia nervosa should the family seek help? Hmm. So, so, so I guess that means risk factors for, mm -hmm. for the development of an eating disorder. Um, and you know, when do you intervene? As so, soon as possible. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, there are the, 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 Dr. Golden pointed out that 95% of the cases of eating disorders take place during adolescence, the onset. That's really important. That this is prime, it doesn't mean they are solved. Uh, that there are no adult cases, and ad adolescence, uh, you know, now is defined age 22 or 23, and if you're a male, probably 40, 45. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, in, in the, 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 the one risk factor is being a female, being an adolescent, being um, between the ages of 13 and 14, beginning to look at dieting and change your eating behaviors. Um, if you see those kinds of things, those are the kinds of things that should be uh, alerting. Now these are in, in certain sense normal, but when there's any weight loss in a person who's supposed to be developing and growing, you begin to, that, that's a worrying sign. If you see things uh, like uh, missing food that you can't explain uh, uh, and no one's had a party or something, or showers right after meals, um, because people go purge in the shower after meals or going to the bathroom after meals. These kind of things are behaviors that would prompt me to want to get you in for a treatment. I don't know if you want to add some things. Um, I also want to point out, we've, we're seeing more, a couple of different phenomena. One, well, one is that we're getting lower and lower ages of people that are developing eating disorders, so be tuned into it even in younger people. 
we're having a, a number of patients that have lost weight in more drastic ways or extreme ways and have gotten very medically unstable and hospitalizing those individuals. So be mindful, of, even if it's somebody that's significantly overweight, if they're losing weight through unhealthy means or too rapidly, that person can get unstable and can also develop um, some significant mental health changes as well. And also, some of the sicker patients that we see are people that don't kind of meet the stereotypic you know, white girl kind of norm. The boys that we see tend to be very, very sick. A lot of times, they, they seem like they're slipping under the radar. People aren't tuning into that. It's a, we have a very ethnically diverse population, a very socioeconomically diverse population. There's really not a stereotype person that we treat. So keep, keep a very broad mind about the people that are, are, might potentially develop eating disorders. We would way love to see somebody that has just the start of an eating disorder than somebody that's very significantly ill. So even if you have any question about it, it's worth getting some assessment. Can I? There, there was a, there's a, just so you know, there's a resource on the NBC Nightly News did a little, por little pro uh, program um, and the Today Show on boys with eating disorders, and um, you can find that on YouTube, I think. I, I would suggest, we, we said that dieting is a slippery slope, and many of the people we see nowadays are people who are just trying to be, quote, unquote, healthy by exercising more and eating healthy. So it is a slippery slope, and I would say the first step would be to go to your pediatrician if there's any concern, and let the pediatrician monitor, assess, and um, if there's a need, refer to appropriate providers, and if you're not satisfied with that, you also can get direct access to appropriate providers. And we are here, and if you live in another community, there are other places as well. And we've heard about resources already today. The, the, the other thing that we're seeing a lot of is something called female athlete triad, mm -hmm. uh, which is in, insufficient intake to balance out the activity that you're doing. And then any time you see somebody who's losing periods, that's a bad sign. Nobody should be losing their periods. An athlete that's, that's maintaining appropriate intake should have normal menses. Um, so that can be a trigger as well. And ultimately, if you're losing your periods, if you have that kind of, of energy output without having appropriate food intake, you can have bone loss and bone damage um, that can be long term. I think one of the challenges is that a lot of parents get a lot of misinformation. Um, adolescent bodies need have fundamentally different nutritional needs and concerns than mine. I mean, I'm all done growing and I'm all done producing my organs and I'm kind of on the slippery slope going down the other way. Um, and a lot of that information is really challenging for families to understand or to, to parse out. And I do think that there's really a need for parents and families to think very carefully about what the nutritional needs of, of a growing child is. Um, and to that end, you know, coaches, health teachers, and others who present information about diet often don't take those developmental concerns into consideration and it's worthwhile us having that kind of conversation in our community I have three sort of treatment types of questions one is um, what, what do you do when a family is not interested in family-centered care and they say can you just fix my child and the other is uh, when we're talking about family-centered care what happens when an adolescent goes to college and they're they're removed from that family support so, um, the, the family-based treatment is not a panacea for anorexia nervosa. It doesn't work for everyone. It's not appropriate for everyone. There's no antibiotic that works for everyone. There's no single medical treatment for anything. So I want to be clear that when, although we do think involving families and including them in the treatment and um, uh, in our programs is important, even if that isn't the particular treatment that they do as an outpatient. Um, that said, there are, are patients and families who want to use individual therapy, and we actually, we offer an individual therapy that we have studied and has been studied by other groups um, that uh, we like a lot. It's called adolescent-focused therapy, and uh, it's not as robust in terms of its effects, um, and it's not as quick but it is a treatment that um, is effective um, and has been shown to be supported empirically. So uh, we offer that. Uh, the goal of family-based treatment is not for the parents and family to remain in control forever. Uh, that should be a pretty short period of time. Um, so uh, the, for a child heading off to college, the, the aspiration would be for the adolescent to be fully in charge, the young adult, in fact, of their own eating and behavior by then. 
Um, if they're not, then there's a real serious question as to whether or not college is really the right thing to do at that time. Because the chances, um, and universities are more and more aware of this, of that not working out are high. And they get sent home. And that sort of failure is not um, a very good thing for the, for the patient or for the, for the family. Um, so looking carefully at the resources that are available in a college is important, too, if they're doing other kinds of approaches. I actually have a specialty clinic now at the Stanford campus, so I treat a lot of Stanford students that have eating disorders. Um, so I've gotten very involved in that. I, I definitely concur with Jim that it, it's, it's important. To, we really would strive for somebody to be at a healthy, normal weight before transitioning to college, because being away from home for anybody is very stressful, um, but particularly for somebody that's struggling with eating issues. No. Um, the other thing that, I, that, um, that made me think of, though, is when we first started using the family-centered model of care, we really thought that it was going to be much more effective for adolescents and not really appropriate for young adults. We've had now a number of young adults that have needed to be hospitalized, and it's been surprising how well oftentimes it's worked to have a family-centered approach, even with the young adult population. And um, a number of individuals take time off of college or, or have some support from their families. Um, during the time that they're recovering, even when they're college students, and that's been really helpful. Because while we recognize that when you turn 18, there's a certain amount of privacy that people have over their medical records, um, there's also still a lot of dependence on that family unit, and that can be leveraged appropriately um, in order to help adolescents who are making that transition make it either more slowly than their peers or in a health-sustaining way. Um, so I certainly know that when I left for college, I was not completely on my own. Um, I'm almost 40, and I'm still not completely on my own and still call my mom for help and support sometimes. And so part of the family-based approach is that we actually try to utilize that to encourage parents to work with their adolescent in determining the steps that would show that they were healthy to leave for school, um, in setting up a safety plan for when they get to school, including signing appropriate release forms so that the school communicates with the parents and, um, and the medical team. And all of these structural supports can really go a very long way toward helping secure whatever gains have been made before college entry. There's actually also a question related to availability of treatment, both pre-hospitalization and some of the different treatment uh, modalities you've talked about. Uh, how available are beds? How available is treatment at our eating disorders? Well, um, as far as I know, in the 17 years we've been here, we have never turned away a patient um, for our inpatient program, uh, no matter what the funding of the patient might be or um, what our bed situation is, we find a way. Because there weren't, uh, there aren't a lot of other resources similar to what um, the, our inpatient program provides in terms of a medically safe place for kids when they're acutely um, unstable. Um, Outpatient-wise, we're also pretty good. Um, uh, we do three intakes a week. Um, we keep mm -hmm. five our now. We increased it. We increased mm -hmm. it to five. Right, a couple of those are adults, adults. true. So, yeah, so we are doing our best to um, uh, increase the access, um, decrease any waiting for um, evaluation, and we do not uh, have a waiting list for our eating disorder patients. We make sure they get in. Um, so that's how it is. Um, just to say, the Center for Adolescent Health in Mountain View, we have eating disorder clinic three days a week. And it's actually not unusual that we're seeing patients with eating disorders five days a week. We have clinic there five days a week, and we sometimes fit in patients in our regular teen clinic. So we have the capacity. There are six or seven attendings and th two or three fellows who are actually seeing patients um, a number of times a week. So There's a question. You mentioned adults. There's a question here about CRT and um, set shifting. and, and the, we're talking about adolescents mostly to, tonight. Mm -hmm. What about adults? Do they have that same? Adults actually have those same um, profiles, only in a more amplified form. So where adolescents may actually not show set shifting difficulties, adults routinely do. We also see those same markers in non-ill siblings. Um, and so what we see is over the course of illness with chronicity, we see increasing neuropsychological changes, um, increasing behavioral changes, and less responsivity to treatment in general, which is why the new study that will be coming out looking at CRT in young adults and adults um, was 
was really great because it was both feasible. People stayed in treatment. We could do the treatment. Um, it was palatable. People liked it. Um, where that's not always the case for adults with um, standard treatments for anorexia nervosa. And, and are there, it's a question about are there any other kinds of markers that you see as physicians, lab tests and things that can be precursors to eating disorders? Precursors or findings that you see? That just says pre, yep, what, what are the lab markers that might indicate that a person has an eating disorder? Well, there, there are a multitude of lab markers in an active state of an eating disorder, but I cannot answer about the precursors. Um, many lab tests that we do show abnormalities, including the white cell count, which can be low, the hemoglobin can be low, the platelet count can be low. Um, the ones of particular concern are some of the electrolyte abnormalities that we see. Um, many of the hormone tests we've alluded to are low. In people who purge, we can see electrolyte abnormalities and also something called amylase, which is produced by the parotids, is often elevated. So none of these are diagnostic. I think we can get as much information from taking a good history and examining a patient appropriately, but we do do the tests primarily looking for medical complications. But I'm not aware of any marker um, that shows that someone is predisposed to an eating disorder. Jim, are you? No, it's not. I, I wanted to add, too, we've had some cases where, where patients have come to us and somebody's taken them to the pediatrician and they've gotten blood work and then they've been reassured, oh, your blood work looks great, so don't, don't be worried about this, even though there were really some pretty significant things going on with that patient. Most of the blood work that we do, there, there are some things that we look for as far as electrolyte abnormalities with the eating disorder. Most of the reason why we do blood work is to make sure that there's not some other physical illness that's causing the weight loss. So most of the basic standard labs that a physician would do in a pediatrics office should be normal. So that's not reassuring. It's really the behaviors that we look for. And maybe one more question is in most of the talks related to anorexia nervosa and, and bulimia nervosa, what about uh, binge eating or other eating disorders not specified? How do they relate to some of the? Mm. Eating disorder not otherwise specified actually makes up a bulk of eating disorder cases, and um, it is a very broad category. Um, it's made up of people with binge eating disorder, uh, people who may have um, specific limitations, very picky eating, challenges with um, vomiting or nausea or other concerns. So it's difficult to answer that question specifically. Here's what we know. People with eating disorder not otherwise specified who are, are caught early in an illness, like they look like anorexia nervosa but don't meet full threshold, or they're looking like they're developing bulimia nervosa, but they aren't purging with the frequency to meet full criteria, they respond to treatment very well. Um, they respond to the same treatments that full threshold eating disorders respond to, as best as we know. Um, but, and they are just as medically at risk as the kids with the full threshold eating disorder. So the answer is, if you have someone that you're concerned about um, and it's looking a little bit like a duck, but it might have a goose bill, still bring it in to, um, because it's really important to get on those symptoms as quickly as possible. Um, the other, you know, binge eating disorder has treatments that respond, um, it appears that cognitive behavioral therapy and possible, and, and in some cases, interpersonal psychotherapy or dialectical behavior therapy um, may actually provide some significant relief around those disorders. We're also seeing binge eating profiles developing in younger and younger kids, um, and so that's something else to keep an eye on. That really completes our evening. There are a couple more questions that we might actually post in a frequently asked questions on our website, but they're related to things that were already said in the lecture. We want to thank everyone here, uh, doctors for coming to speak, interested community for coming uh, together on this very important uh, topic, coming to Lucille Packard Children's Hospital this evening. Um, we have another lecture on March 13th that will be uh, in, in our Your Child's Health University series that will be on integrative medicine. 
uh, for children and what parents might want to know about uh, mind-body therapies and dietary supplements in, uh, in children. And you can register for that program as well by going online to lpch.org. Uh, please do turn in your evaluation. We'd love to know what you thought, particularly if you would like to see something like this expanded. And we wish you a very uh, good evening. And thank you again for attending. Thank you. <laughs>